Perikhov plus Agalif. Okay, here we are. Okay. So yesterday we left off with yesterday we left off with um, um, the uh, um, the idea just just the 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 the, 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 the idea that, that there was a skip of thirty eight years over here. Right? So that that was the first thing that was what we spoke about yesterday. Now if you go ahead to Perik Bey's, Perik Chof Pasuk Ches. Okay, now this begins uh, one of, the, uh, one of the, the, the most discussed sections of the Torah. There are certain sections of the Torah, like the snake speaking to Chava and, and the Torah being given. If you take a look at Perik Ches, uh, Perik Chof, it's on uh, Pasuk Ches, 842. Um, by Dabar Hashem al Moshe Lebar, four lines from the bottom in 842. Kach es hamata, take the staff. The hakel es ha'eda, gather the people. Ata ve'aron achicha. V'dibartem el hasela, speak to the rock. Le'enehem in front of them. V'nasan meimav, it'll produce its water. V'otseisa le'emayim min hasela v'yishkiyasa es ha'eda ve'ez bi'iram. You're going to get water out of the rock, and you're going to water. You're going to provide water for the people <coughs> and for their animals. Now. If you remember the very first time that the Jews, when the first Jewish people first came out of Mitzrayim, the first time Moshe Rabbeinu came to the rock, what did Hashem say to do? The very first time. He said, hit the rock. No, no, the first time was hit the rock. If you turn back the Parshas B'Shalach, turn back the Parshas B'Shalach for a second, and the people get, get thirsty. So uh, they come out of, uh, out of Yamsuf, it's on page... Um, Where is it? Um, where is it? Three ninety. Uh, where is it? Yes, very good. Thank you very much, Leor. Page three ninety. Uh, so five lines from the bottom. Six <laughs> lines from the bottom. And vayomer vayomer Hashem on Moshe avor lifteyam. More than that, uh, eight lines from the bottom. Vayom Hashem al Moshe, avor lifnei ha'am, v'kach itcha miziknei Yisrael. Go in front of the people and take the elders. Umatcha asher ikisa boas ha'yor, the staff with which you hit the yor, kach biyodcha v'elachta. Hine niyome lefanech Hashem al atzur b'chore, v'hikisa batzur, hit the rock, v'yotzu b'menu mayim, and the water will come out. V'shosa ha'am, v'yaz ken Moshe. So the first time Moshe was told, hit the rock. This time, Hashem says to Moshe, okay, okay, now speak to the rock. Now, one of the commentaries points out, what's the difference between, well, why is this time speaking and last time is hitting? So, so one of the commentaries says, well, it's only like the same, the rock got hit once, now it only needs a reminder. They compare it to a father who spanked his kid. You know, father spanked his son once, the next time all he's got to do is talk to him. Oh, that's all he's got to do. <laughs> and the kid cooperates. So, you know, all you can do is, 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 is say a word. So, so the, this time, you don't need to hit it. It's obviously at a very, very uh, simple level. What's the difference between hitting and speaking? What's really the difference between hitting and speaking? Where's the difference between hitting the rock and speaking to the rock? Uh, one hurts more. <laughs> one hurts more, okay. What's the difference between hitting and speaking? Both are miracles. I mean, you know, honestly, if a guy hits a rock and out comes water, it's pretty, pretty impressive too. And yet, what happens over here? He says to Moshe Rabbeinu, Vayikach, bottom of 842, Vayikach, Moshe, es hamatem, lifnei Hashem, kasher tivo, Moshe takes the staff, Vayakilu Moshe, v'aron es hakol lo pnei hasel, Moshe gathers the people in front of the rock, Vayomer lem shimu no hamorim, listen to you rebels, how does he translate the arts go? Listen to O rebels. Hamin hasel hazanotzi lachamayim, are we going to get water from the stone? Vayora Moshe es yodo vayaches hasela b'mateo paim, he hits it twice. Vayetsu mayim rabim vatesh deyda v'yom. A lot of water comes out and they drink. And then the very next line, Vayomer Hashem Moshe v'yom, yan lo emantem bilak tishen le'e b'nei Yisrael, since you did not sanctify me in front of the b'nei Yisrael by speaking to the rock, most commentaries learn. L'chein lo saviu es hakol hazel aretz asher nasat lehem. You're not going to lead them into the land of Israel. Those are the waters of strife. That's how the arts go. That's a good translation. The waters of strife. 
So there are a lot of questions here. Question number one is, A, why does Hashem want Moshe Rabbeinu to speak rather than hitting? B, why does Moshe Rabbeinu hit rather than speaking? And C, why does Aaron get punished along with Moshe Rabbeinu? I mean, he wasn't, uh, Moshe Rabbeinu was, was, was the one who was doing it. So why, what, what, what happened here? That's what the commentary's got. Now, there's tremendous amount of discussion over it. I just want to give a couple of insights on what's going on. The difference between hitting and speaking is that it's the same thing as somebody doing, you know, they get these guys who are sleight of hand, sleight of hand, what do you call it? You know, guys who are, what do you call illusionists? I've always felt that as soon as an illusionist touches something, as soon as he uses his hands, it's different. I, you know, if you're standing with your hands behind the back and you bring about an effect, I'm impressed. As soon as the guy touches and uses his hands, so he obviously knows some sort of trickery that I don't know. He's using his hands. Once the hands get involved, it reduces the, 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 the effect because the hand is quicker than the eye or whatever it is that they say. And once you're using your hands, <laughs> who knows what you're doing? To hit a rock is also impressive. But it's not as impressive as speaking to a rock. There's a different level over there. And what is, hold all the questions. Itamar, for the first half hour, hold questions. And after that, the last 15 minutes, we take questions. The, 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 the first, the, 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 the uh, what do you call it? The, the, uh, to hit something, to make physical contact with it, is not as impressive as just giving an order and it cooperates. And what that represents is different levels of hishtadlus. You're trying to get water. You're trying to get sustenance. There are different ways of making hishtadlus. You could go to work. You go to work for your parnasa, which is itself a miracle, because most jobs anyway pay you much more than you really deserve, right? But a guy, you know, a guy works and he's a, you know an accountant and he makes two hundred thousand dollars a year for you know and, 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 you know well you know, that's, that's a miracle. It's a nice, right? You make your ishtadlus, but ultimately you have to realize that the parnas is coming from Hashem. There's another level where you just sit and learn and you do nothing and you get your parnas. You just sit and learn in kolo and you get a parnas. So that's, what, that's even a higher level of, that's a less ishtadlus, yet HaKadosh Baruch is providing for you. So here, they're about to go into the land of Israel. They're in the 40th year. The land of Israel operates on a different level of faith than anywhere else in the world. When you live in Israel, that's why there's, there's the rain in Italy, there's a lot more rain than there is in Israel. Because in Israel, we have to daven and hope that HaKadosh Baruch Hu provides for us. We're meant to be on a certain level of trust in God. Moshe Rabbeinu feels that since the Jewish people started fetching and complaining, they're complaining over here. Why are they complaining? Where's the water? That's what the response was here. It was a response to the people. If you're still fetching and complaining, you're not on a high enough level. You're not on that level where we can talk to the rock. What's his mistake? The same mistake as always, which is, but Hashem said, speak to it. Once you start making calculations, you know, there's always, there's always problems. You know, Chafetz Chaim has a very famous, Chafetz Chaim has a very famous story about a king who sends a messenger to a foreign king. And he says to this messenger, I need you to go to this foreign king, and no matter what happens, do not make any wagers with him. Don't make any wagers. So the guy says, okay, he's gonna do what the king wants. He goes to this foreign king, and he comes in, he says, regards from my king, and I hear he sent a, sent a message for you. And this other king looks at him and goes, wow, thank you very much. And, I, you know, I think that's an unbelievable tattoo you have on your chest. He says, uh, well, Excellency, actually, I don't have a tattoo. He says, no, 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 I, I could tell that you have a tattoo, and, I'm a, and it's a nice tattoo. He says, no, Excellency, I tell, tell you the truth, I don't have a tattoo. He says, listen, I'm willing to wager $1 million for your king that you have a tattoo. He says, but I don't. He says, oh, will you wager? Will you make a bet? He says, okay, I'll, I'll have one on with you for a million bucks for my king. I mean, this is going to be easy. He says, okay, please remove your shirt. Let's see. So in front of the entire royal court, he takes off his shirt, and sure enough, there's no tattoo. So the king smiles and says, you're right, and he pays him a million bucks. And he comes back to his king and he says, excellency, he said, did you do what I told you to do? Yes, and I have good news. 
I've got a million dollars for you. The king immediately tenses up. He says, how did you get the million dollars? He says, I want it in a wager from the other king. He says, what was the wager? He said, I have a tattoo. I told him I didn't. And then what happened? Well, I proved. How did you prove it? I took off my shirt. The king says, you fool. I had bet $10 million with that king that he cannot get one of my royal subjects to remove his shirt in front of the entire royal court. <laughs> you just cost me nine million bucks, right? So what did the king say to him? He said, don't make any wagers. But I think it's a good idea. Let me do the thinking. Of course, Rosh says to Moshe Rabbeinu, speak to the rock. <laughs> Moshe Rabbeinu made a calculation. I don't, the Jewish people, there are other commentaries say, you know why he did this? Because if he speaks to the rock, the rock's gonna cooperate. And if the rock cooperates, you know, maybe we could tell you, I think we should better turn that off, the, 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 the what do you call it, thanks, Yona. If the rock cooperates when told what to do, what happens to the Jewish people when they're told what to do and they don't obey? That creates a prosecution against the Jewish people. There's a prosecution against the Jewish people. The rock is told what to do and it does what it is. And you, the Jewish people, don't do what you do. So much of it didn't want to create a prosecution against the Jewish people. And therefore, he hits the rock rather than speak. hitting hitting everybody else what they're told when they're hit. So that's not a prosecution. But if he speaks to the rock and the rock cooperates, so then that creates a prosecution against the Jewish people. Why is our own taken to task? Moshe Rabbeinu hit twice. Rashi says Aaron should have protested. When was he going to protest? Once Moshe Rabbeinu hit it the first time, what's he supposed to do? At that point, you know, you shouldn't have done that. I mean, it's too late at that point. Yeah, but he should have said something before he hit it the second time. And therefore, since Aaron didn't protest, Aaron has taken the task of Moshe Rabbeinu to lose the right to go into Eretz Israel. Right here, they lose the right to go into Eretz Israel. So, the, uh, 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 the first time, by the way, the first time he hit the rock, I'll tell you something incredible. Why did he hit it the first time? So one of them, Forshim, says, very interesting. Why was the rock, in whose merit was the well there? What did we say yesterday? Miriam. It was in Miriam's merit. It was in Miriam's merit. Women do not have the obligation to, to, to speak, to learn Torah. They don't have the mitzvah of saying Krishna. Verbal mitzvahs, women don't have those mitzvahs. Only the men have the obligation to speak Torah. Women don't learn Torah. Therefore, since it was in her merit the first time, it was brought out with action. When she died, the well came, the water came back in whose merit? In the merit of Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu is Torah. For Torah, you speak. And not only that, the Medr says, what was he supposed to say to the rock? Right. It says, God said, speak to the rock. So what were you assuming Moshe Rabbeinu was meant to say to the rock? Oh, please, rock, <laughs> give us some water. Right? That's what Moshe Rabbeinu said. That's what you're assuming. You know, I'm gonna, or as the guy said in my shear the other day, you know, <laughs> well, I don't want to repeat it. But, but what, <laughs> the guy, you know, they, they, they said, remember what, what he said? I, 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 we were in shear. We're in sure we're talking about what happens if somebody, you get in an argument with somebody, you find out that you're right. So one of the guys says, well, you rock his face, <laughs> right? Which is the first time I've heard that eloquent expression, <laughs> right? So, you know, you know what, what are you going to do with the rock? What are you going to do with the rock? You don't go and say, oh, please, rock water, says the Medrash. He was supposed to say a word of, he was supposed to say like a, a Dvar Torah in front of the rock. You know, start learning about start learning about <coughs> cows falling off of a path. He says, "Well, Rav Kahana says this, or Rav Yochanan says this. That's what he should have said to the rock. And also, the water would have come out." Oh, wow. So, because the women aren't involved in learning Torah, when it came to the rock, when as long as it was there in the merit of Miriam, that involved an in action. But once it avoid, once we're on to, what do you call it? We're on to Moshe Rabbeinu's rock, which is Torah. So then you speak to the rock, and Moshe Rabbeinu. For whatever the, and again, if you take a look at any of the commentaries, if you, if you look at the commentaries in English, there are many different approaches over here to what happened. The Rambam says, where did Moshe Rabbeinu's mistake come, and the Chassam Sofer as well? Where is the ultimate flaw here? You know what the flaw is? Moshe Rabbeinu said, Moshe Rabbeinu said, Shimu no hamorim. He got angry. And because he got angry, and again, we're talking about anger at Moshe Rabbeinu's level. We have a very subtle level of anger. Moshe Rabbeinu's anger, because he got angry, he made a mistake. When you get angry, you make mistakes. He got angry, he made a mistake. I was once at a, uh, I was, I'll tell you two stories. The first one was a, uh, I was at a shul meeting. 
what happened was when I moved into my neighborhood, so they built a shul. And there were two floors on the shul. When the Ashkenazi floor was downstairs, the Sephardi shul was upstairs. And as always, there was some misunderstanding about who's paying for what, that sort of thing. And who owns which part of the land. There's always, you know, all, all for, for the sake of the mitzvah. And uh, so there's a mitzvah. I just moved into the neighborhood. I wasn't even part of the neighborhood. I just moved in. My was within, a, within weeks. I just moved into the neighborhood. I wasn't even long enough, long enough to, 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 to fight with anybody yet. And uh, so they have this shul meeting. Now, gentlemen, take a piece of advice. If you have some free time, don't attend shul meetings. But there was a, there was a shul meeting for all the members. So we're standing there, and I didn't say anything because I wasn't really part of the thing. I'm just watching what's going on. And, I was like, and at a certain point, each one is saying like this, this is saying this. And a guy, I actually saw this with my own eyes. A guy gets angry, and he bangs on a shender. He goes, that's it, this is all in Hebrew. He goes, that's it, enough talk. All we've been doing is talking, 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 talking. That's all we've been doing is talking, talking, the whole time is talking, talking. He went on for about 10 minutes talking about how all we're doing is talking. <laughs> and, and I'm telling you, people, I, we were looking around, people were just watching this like, is this for real? Right? It was ridiculous. And when, 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 you, when you get angry, you start. You, you, you can do a lot. You, you can do a lot of funny things when you get angry. You make a lot of mistakes when you get angry. Your brother leaves the key. Your brother was supposed to leave the key for you, right? You were. You told your brother leave the key in the mailbox, right, where nobody would think to look, or under the mat, right. And then you get home, and you're, you check the mailbox, and the key's not there. So what do you do? What does most people do? Most people punch the door. Because that'll help, right? <laughs> so then you have, now you got, now you're not only locked out, but you're locked out and in pain, right? And then the next day, you got to go to the doctor and you have a broken finger. Yeah, yeah, this is all as a result of anger. So the Torah says a person gets angry, a person makes a mistake. Moshe Rabbeinu, at his level, at his level, which is an incredibly subtle level, and if we were there, we wouldn't even have noticed it. But because he got angry, that's what cost him going into Eretz Yisrael. That's how the Rambam learns it, that's how the Chassam Sofer learns it. Okay, now I'll show you something remarkable. Hashem says to Moshe, turn back for a second. I want to show you, um, where is it? What Pusik is it? Page 8? What page is it? 842. 842. Yeah. The, bottom, the two bottom lines. Get water from the cell. I want to show you something. Is there a marker here? Oh, good. Can I, can I get to this? I'm safe. I don't know if I'm... Okay, here's the marker. You had a secret stash that came from my room, right? So here's the word "sella." Okay, can everybody see this? If you can't see, move over a little. Here's the word "sella." Okay, take water out of the cella. How do you spell the letter Samech? How would you spell it? Samech, Mem, Chaf Sofis, okay? How do you spell Lamed? Lamed, Mem, Dalid. How do you spell Ayin? Yud, Nun. Take the three middle letters here, and what do you get? Mem, Yud, Mem, you get Mayim. Mayim is right in the middle of the Sela. So it says some Mayim bin HaSela. Can you get a look at that on the, yeah, on the what do you call it? Mayim is you got Mem, put the Yud over here, Mem, Yud, Mem. You get mayim. So it says, Hotseisa mayim min hasela. Literally, take water out of the middle word, sela. From the middle sela, spells out, and you take out mayim. Can you see that over there? Okay. Okay. Um, where's. where's mm. Mm. Not bad. The. Uh, okay. That's the. Uh, okay. Um, take a look. Listen, whatever works, man. The coffee's not strong enough today. Okay. Take a look at the next section. They laugh. Okay. Take a look at page 846. Okay. So it says, Vayisu mi Kadesh. Page 846, bottom of the page. They come to the little mountain on top of the big mountain. Apparently there's a, a little mountain, and there's a big mountain with a little mountain at the top. Hashem says to Moshe, 
Shem says to Moshe and Aaron, Ye Osef Aharon El Amov. Now, literally, what do these words mean? What do the words Ye Osef Aaron El Amov mean? What do they literally mean? Aaron should be gathered to his people, which is another way of saying what? He's out of here. He's out of here. He's going to, Aaron is going to die. Okay? Now, the way the Torah puts it is Ye Osef El Amov, he should be gathered to his people, which in and of itself is a is a bizarre expression because when a person dies, he's not gathered to his people, he's gathered to a, to a pit with dust, with dirt in it. So this is an indication that there is something afterwards because you're gathered to your people. They are not gathered to people. A person who's buried is all alone. So gathered to the people refers to the neshama of the person. After a person is nifter, the neshama goes up to its people. Not only that, the Svarim talk about how when a person is nifter, then it is his relatives or people that he knew who welcome him when he comes up there because apparently it's pretty frightening. So there's like a welcome committee just to calm him down, right? Then they put him in the toaster. But there, there's a there's the, but there's but there's a welcoming committee. There's a welcoming well not us because we're tzaddikim. I'm talking about those who go into the toaster. But they, there's there's a welcoming committee to, to that uh, the person should because there, there are all sorts of discussions about the neshama being in a state of confusion. And, but if a person's good, so it's all good. So there's a welcoming committee up there waiting for him. So it says, Aaron is not going to enter, and therefore he is going to pass away now. Because you provoked me at Meimariva. Now, by the way, the word Meriva only appears twice. The Jewish people, I told you yesterday, there are ten times that they quarreled in the 40 years, only twice is the word meriva used. Now, when is it used? Both times by the water. When they, both times when they, this parsha and earlier, it uses the expression meriva that they quarreled with Moshe Rabbeinu. When by Korach, it doesn't say meriva, and when they were quetching about it, it doesn't say meriva. It's only said it by the water. So the Mephoshim point out, why is that? that it's called Me Meriva. The water is called the water of contention, the water of argument. And the first time explained, water was created on the second day. And on the second day, there was a split. The day when the water, at the time of creation, the original split, the original Meriva, took place on the second day, the day the water was split. And since when the water was split, it was called that's, that's symbolic of a quarrel. When it f- comes to the quarreling over water, it's called meriva. So I was thinking to myself, it's interesting, because the water was split. You know, I told you, I told you once, or more than once, anything that it says in Sefer Bereshis means that that's how the world is. So if it says the world was created in seven days in Sefer Bereshis, we have seven-day weeks. Where does the idea of a seven-day week come from? It means it's inherent in the creation that there is a seven-day week. When was the international meeting that decided this? Everywhere in the world, if you go to Afghanistan, go to China, go to go to go to uh, Venezuela, everybody's got a seven-day week, isn't it? You never saw, thought about that, did you? Tamar, why does everybody have a seven-day week? When did everybody decide on this? Right? Everybody's got a seven-day week. All right, the Australians are a little confused about exactly which day is Sunday, which day is Saturday. All right, because there's an international dateline issue. Okay, but it's still seven days. And in China, apparently 400 or 500 years ago in China, they once tried to make it an eight-day week, and there was some sort of revolution. People got killed. Nobody accepted it. Right? They tried to make an eight-day week. And by the way, anytime you want to say something and you want to like sound like you know what you're talking about, just say, oh, in China a few hundred years ago, because nobody knows anything about it, right? So everybody just goes, ah, 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 ah. This is true. There was, at some point in China, they tried to make an eight-day week. By the way, we are often accused, the, uh, the, the Haredim, you know, we're accused of being turtles in a shell, and we're so unaware. We don't know what's going on in the world. So, yeah, we don't know what's going on in the world. Gentlemen, what's the name of the premier of China? What, 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 what? Xi Jinping. Xi Jinping. Yeah, Xi Jinping. You sure? You don't know. <laughs> Not only that, when you said it, nobody even knows to be able to know if you know or you don't know. 
Right? So people say to me, you know, people say, we're unaware. You don't know the name of the premier of the biggest country in the world? And we're the ones who are unaware? You don't know the name of what's the guy? It is something like she, something like that. XI is, is she. Then you don't know either. You're right. I'm unaware. Right? Uh, what do you go? I know the name of the Chinese ping pong champion. That you don't know. Uh huh. But the, uh, and which is a lot more significant than the premier. I don't even know if he's a premier. He might be called a president for all I know. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, where was that internet? When you see in Safer Bracious, here, Safer Bracious talks about gold. When was the international conference that decided that gold is valuable? And there's gold in Africa, and there's gold in, in Mexico, and there's gold all over in, up in the north. Where did, when was that internet? The Torah itself in Bereshis talks about gold. It mentions it twice in Bereshis. It talks about that's where the gold is, and that's where the good gold is. So apparently gold, it doesn't say that's where the soap is. It says that's where the gold is. That means that it is, in, it, in human, it, it is inherent in the created world that that is a reality. The same way there is something in the world called machlokas. There's dispute. So when it comes to the water, that's where it's called dispute, meriva. But there's a positive usage of it. Where's the positive usage of it? Where's the positive usage of dispute? Also with water. The waters of Torah. When you're in a base medrash and you dispute, you're trying to learn the Gemara, you argue with your chavrusa. Because by arguing, you get to the truth. That's assuming you're arguing to get to the truth, not on a personal level. And it's water, because water is Torah, in Mayim el Torah. So the same water, which could be symbolic of a negative dispute, is symbolic of a positive dispute. So here we have, Aaron is told that he's going to lose, doesn't go in, and therefore it's time for him to be nifter. Now, take a look at the next passage. There's a very interesting idea here. Kaches Aaron ve'es Elozer beno, Vehal osam hor hor. Take Aaron and the uh, uh, Elazar, his son, and go up to the mountain. Now the Jewish people see that the three of them are going up a mountain. The half shait as Aaron es begadov vil bashtem es Elazar beno. Take off Aaron's garments and put them on Elazar. Now Rashi says over here. Sorry, it's not Rashi. Aaron uh, uh, will be gathered in and he will die over there. Vayas Moshe Kasher Tiva Hashem, even though it was difficult for him. Vayalu el hor hor leine kol ha'ida. Vayavshet Moshe es Aaron es begodov. Our Moshe took off the garments of off of Aaron. One second. I know, I know. Vayal Beishel Sabes Elazar Beno, Vayomas Aaron Shem Barosha Hart. Aaron dies, Vayerid Moshe Elazar Bina Hart. They come down. Vayiru Kola Eida Kigov Aaron Vayivku. Everybody sees Aaron died, they cry. Vayivku as Aaron Shloshim Yom Kol Beis Yisrael. The entire Jewish people cry for Aaron. Take a look at the end of the part of the Torah. Keep your finger on the place here. Look all the way at the end of the Zosa Bracha when Moshe Rabbeinu is Nifter. All the way at the end. And it says, um, page 1122, page 1122. And if you look six lines from the bottom, it says, Vayivku The Jewish people cried for Moshe 30 days. The B'nai Yisrael. Here, what does it say by our own? Who mourned for him? All of the Jewish, the house of Israel. There it says by Moshe Rabbeinu, Vayivku B'nei Yisrael. doesn't say Kol Beis Yisrael. By Aaron it says Kol Beis Yisrael. Why? Say the to Chazal, because Aaron was the Ohev Shalom, Merodev Shalom. Aaron was involved with everybody. Men, women, making peace, that sort of thing. He was beloved by everybody. What was Moshe's job? Moshe was a Rashi Shiva. Moshe taught Torah to the men. The women didn't have any, there was no connection over there. They had nothing to do with it. Moshe was the lawgiver who spent time with the men. So by Moshe Rabbeinu, it was the men who mourned for him for 30 days. 
by Aaron, it was everybody who worked, because it was beloved to the entire Jewish people. Now, there's a problem here. Because Aaron, what, what was Aaron's status? It was the Kohen Godot. Okay, now, Moshe Rabbeinu, the Torah says, he took off the garments and he put them on a lozer. Well, the problem is like this. If I take your shirt off and put it on him, and then I take your tzitzis off and put it on him, so now what's going to be where? It's going to be opposite. It's going to be opposite of the way it should be. Well, the Torah says he took them off of Aaron and put them on a lozer. Well, if you take them off one at a time and put it on him, so then, you know, you know he's going to look awfully funny over here. And so the Medrash says, yeah, well, that's the way he did it. And then when they left the cave, they walked out of the cave, miraculously the clothing switched places properly, the clothing, what do you call it, switched their, 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 their position, and then they come down to the Jewish people, and they see that Moshe and Eloz are come down, and he's dressed like the Kohen Gadol. That's what the Medrash says. You want to hear something incredible? Just to show you, just to show you how consistent this whole business is. You got a problem. What's the halacha for a regular Kohen as far as coming into contact with his next of kin? He's allowed to. For his father, mother, brother, sister, son, daughter, or wife. A regular Kohen could come into contact. Coming into contact means being in the same room or physical contact with the next of kin. A regular Kohen, Kohen Hedyot, is allowed to come into contact with the next of kin. What about a Kohen Godel? He's not allowed to. He's not allowed to be even in the same room as even as his next of kin. Even his father, mother, not allowed to be in the same room. You have a problem over here. Aaron dies. So who's going to become the next Kohen Gadol? His son. His son. So how can Elizabeth be in the cave there with Aaron when Aaron dies? As soon as Aaron dies, he's the Kohen Gadol. And as soon as he's Kohen Gadol, if Aaron dies, and he's in the cave, so he becomes Tame, right? Uh, when does he become the Kohen Gadol? And so he puts the clothing on the right way. So the clothing go on him inside out and backwards or whatever that's called when you put it upside down, when you put the clothing on inside out, whatever, however, however you put him on, in the opposite order. So at that point, he's not yet the coin goto. He's a regular coin wearing the guy. Then they leave the cave. The, coin, the clothing, now he becomes, he only becomes a coin goto, but he leaves the cave. And therefore, man, good answer, isn't it? And then you understand why the Medrash says that that's what happened in its switch. Because there's got to be an answer to the question of how the Kohen Gadol could possibly be in the cave with his father. Now, I had a thought over here that, um, I had a thought over here about, about Aaron's death. I didn't see any commentary say this, but, you know, when Moshe Rabbeinu was nifter, who took over for him? Who took over Yeshua? It didn't go to his sons. Aaron is nifter, and it goes to his son. Why? Why? Why is it? Okay, so Yeshua it says that he served Moshe Rabbeinu in the, you know, he was always the attendant with Moshe Rabbeinu wherever Moshe went. Yeshua went. Okay, that's all true. But I had a different thought over here, and if it's not exactly what happened here, it's certainly true in life in general. When there's a halacha. Let's say there's a rabbi of a, a rav of a community, or let's say there's the head of a yeshiva, or any other position of prominence. What's the halacha, or even a kohen gadol? What's the halacha as far as who takes over that position? Who's supposed to take over the rav of the community? Is nifter? Who takes over the position? The answer is, the son takes over as long as the son is qualified. Even if there are people who are more qualified, as long as the son is qualified, he gets the position and then he'll become even more qualified as time passes. The classic example was when the Rosh Hashiva of the Mir Yeshiva was nifter, of Dustin Sifinko was nifter about 10 years ago. So his son, Rav Lazar Yudel, became the new, new, the new Rosh Hashiva. Now, he was very young, in the mid 40s when it happened. He was qualified. But there were other people in the Mir Yeshiva who were 20 or 30 years older than him who were much bigger Torah scholars than him. Nothing to take to anything away from him, but simply time-wise, you know, he's 30 years younger than some of these very giant Talmudic Chachamim. Yet, he's qualified, therefore he gets the position and becomes more qualified as time, as time passes. So he becomes the Rosh Yeshiva. Aaron Akoin was the Oiv Shalom. When is there fighting over a position? When is there ever fighting over a position? 
Usually, not always, because sometimes among certain Hasidic dynasties there's fighting even among the children themselves, but in many cases, if the father dies and it goes to his son, there's peace. Everybody's okay with that. When there's no son to follow, then all of a sudden there are different factions who's going to take over, and then you get the quarreling and the strife. Aaron, who himself was an Ohev Shalom, Verodev Shalom, so his position goes in the most peaceful transfer of power, <laughs> not that it's power, but what they call, goes to his son. Because by going to his son, then there's not going to be any, and there's not going to be any fighting, there's not going to be any strife. Whereas if it doesn't go to the son, then you run into, you often run into problems. That's the, that's the reality. But the halacha is that if the son is qualified by a coin gadol, then the son takes over for the coin gadol, even if there are people around who are more qualified. All right, gentlemen, we'll let it go over here. We'll continue tomorrow.